Um, hello, you're all very welcome on what is uh, probably one of the most inclement evenings um, uh, in uh, the autumn, which uh, would be par for the course, really. Um, and uh, wet weather shall recur throughout my talk, um, so it's rather apropos. I also have to confess that I've brought you here under slightly false pretenses, um, uh, in that um, technically my lecture is not about family history, um, uh, but we thought that that would bring people out, and so it has done. Um, <laughs> um, and I should also say, technically speaking, I'm not either a family historian or a local historian. Although I do a bit of both, I'm really a historian of, religion, of 19th century Irish religion. And I've kind of expanded my areas of interest over the last few years since taking over our master's program in local history um, that you can do through the Open University. And while I'm giving my plug, I might as well point you to the wee leaflet on your chair so if anyone's interested in thinking about doing um, a master's study, you can always talk to me um, about that later on. And that's really uh, the end of the product placement part of the lecture. Um, so I hope you're all very welcome. Um, and I should say that before everyone starts to walk out, that um, really the lectures, to, the lectures over the next um, few weeks are technically, as I said, not about family history, but they are going to be about understanding your family through local history, through, uh, through gaining an understanding of the local context in which your family um, and members of your family potentially um, would have operated. Now one of the things that I always find um, when I do family history is that I never understand enough about the um, environment that my family was in at the time. I never understand enough about the sources to be able to know whether or not for sure this is important or is significant or this is a real find or if this is something that was unusual or that this was something that nobody else has ever done. Um, I just never, um, I never seem like I know enough to be able to understand the documents fully. So I thought that the, one of, I'm assuming other people have similar problems, and I'm not the only one. Um, so I thought, therefore, that, the, that it might be interesting and potentially helpful um, to run a lecture series that would try and examine a number of contexts in which you might potentially find family members um, of your own and across the north of Ireland. And so I thought, obviously, then tonight's lecture focusing on um, rural society and on agriculture um, would be an environment in which many people would have had family members uh, in the past, even if they're no longer associated with the land. And again, similarly, too, we've all had to go to school, so we're all bound to have had family members who have gone to school or involved, and been involved in education of some kind. Um, our third lecture then focuses on religion and the way in which um, church going and church activity and church behavior um, would have influenced our family members in the past. And then the final two lectures then are looking at the role of industrialization, the movement of people into, um, into factory work and into the cities. And then finally wrapping up um, with a lecture on um, crime and police and the military. So if you had family members who were soldiers, or family members who were in the police force, or perhaps family members who were on the wrong side of the law, um, that lecture then might um, uh, be uh, illustrative of um, some of the experiences of your family members there. So the whole point of the lectures really then is as though that we'll all be able to better understand our family members and the roles that they occupied in the past and in particular, this notion that I'm very keen to stress, and hopefully will stress throughout the lectures, if you hang on that long um, to get to the end, is uh, this notion of typicality, okay? This, this notion of usualness, okay? Or um, the, the extent to which our families were typical, or to the extent to which they illustrate wider trends, and the extent to which we can therefore say that our family illustrate um, what historians know about the past. Um, so I've tried to use a variety of sources um, uh, and will use and hopefully touch on a range of sources throughout these lectures that you yourself will be able to use. And you don't even 
I shouldn't say this in Prony, but you don't even have to come in. Um, for Prony has such wonderful sources online. Um, but um, so many of the sources are available online in your own home through your internet connection. And uh, but many of the sources are available here and elsewhere. Now, in order to make the topics and this this whole mass of information a bit manage more manageable. Um, I've decided to focus on one particular parish um, in Antrim, where my family came from. Surprise, surprise. And, um, and so we'll be following and charting um, my family, the Oglebees, who are from northeast Antrim, from the parish of Kilwater, um, which is just outside Larn. Now, has anybody been to any of my lectures before? A few wee hands. So you'll know that I drone on about the Oglebees constantly. Um, so apologies in advance for that. But I would like to think that I'm constantly developing and learning new things about the Oglebees and what they're doing, and that over the course of these lectures, we'll be seeing the Oglebees and kill water in new ways um, uh, than before. And I hope as well that what I'm doing by doing this is to show you how you could develop your own subject or you could begin to develop a study um, uh, without too much difficulty. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the fact uh, that I've said already is, is that I'm no expert. I'm certainly no expert in your particular area. And there are lots of great experts out there already. Um, and, um, and so I want to acknowledge right from the very start that this lecture is standing really on the shoulder of some really excellent giants which I hope we'll in, uh, be able to introduce you to as well. So, let's get started then into the sort of the, the proper part of the lecture. So what I want to look at tonight is this sort of a, um, a way, this is this sort of a, a structure. I thought that we would start each lecture with some sort of an overview of the period. This would be the kind of thing that I would give to undergraduates um, at a university. The big picture, as it were, where we would look at the land system and the rural economy in Ulster. Um, and then I want to look at some ways in which um, our fa families and people operated within that rural environment. Um, the idea of population, of nuptiality, which is just a fancy word for getting married and fertility, which is just another fancy word for having babies. Um, and then we'll look at um, the Oglebees and see what they've been doing in the countryside. And then I have a few slides at the end for people who are interested. Um, and I should also mention as well that Glynn from Prony will come up after I'm done to have a few wee words about the Prony collections that relate to the stuff that I'm talking about tonight. So, are, you, are we ready? Okay. Now, so what I see right, I'm doing right now is really providing you with a context, with an overview or a background, really. So, and so looking, first of all, at the land system. Now, again, the focus for almost all of what I'm talking about tonight is really the 19th century. And we can trail it back a little bit into the 18th century, and we can, we'll move forward a little bit into the 20th century. Um, but for the most part, we're looking at this period of great change in Irish history, which is the 19th century. And in the, boat, in the 19th century, as you all know, um, Ireland was divided into sort of three major groups or classes. And this is very, very rough. We have the landlords at the top of our little social pyramid, and then we have the tenant farmers in the middle, and at the very bottom we have the poor or the laboring classes. And of course, as you go down the pyramid, the numbers of people in each class grow, um, and the majority of the population then um, as today, really, is, um, is, is down at the, in the lowest rungs of society. So I want to look at each group, just therefore very briefly, and look at the way in which they, sort of, they operate in the 19th century. So in Ireland in the 19th century, there were roughly speaking on average around about 6,500 landlords. Um, now this sort of, that figure dates from the 1870s. And this included, really, individuals who owned more than 500 acres. And it included um, about 700 landlords who really, between them, owned over 50% of the island, of Ireland. So these individuals had estates that were well over 5,000 acres. In Ulster, these territorial magnates um, would have had estates 
that were large and impressive. The Marcus of Downshire, for example, with his 120,000 acres, or Lord O'Neill with his 60,000, or the Duke of Abercorn with his uh, 60,000. Um, and there was then below them another range of landlords who owned 30 to 40,000 acres of land, like, for example, the Earl of Antrim, who owned, as you would think, much of North Antrim. Now, these individuals were obviously extremely rich and wealthy. They had landed titles. They were members of the British aristocracy. They were all Protestant, um, almost exclusively members of the Church of Ireland. Um, some of them had extensive estates in England as well, which they considered to be their primary seats. Others lived here on their Irish estates. Some of them were neglect neglectful of their Irish estates. Others sought to so-called improve their estates or to modernize them in the way that they felt was best at the time. Needless to say, these were the power brokers of Irish society at the time. They had the right to vote, they had the right to enforce the law, to serve as magistrates, and all sorts of other powerful positions within society. And of course, they got their money by the rental that they took from their landed estates. Now the main people who they leased their land to were tenant farmers, this next group. And in 1861 the census indicates there were around, roughly speaking around 500,000 of these. These were the real movers in the economy, really. Um, they were a very diverse group and could represent farmers with substantial holdings um, uh, and farmers as well who were very poor with very tiny farms. About 20% of this farming class would have had a formal lease with um, a landowner. Um, and in the years, in the 18th century, it would have been quite common to have granted very long leases to farmers over a substantial chunk of land, and these individuals would have been called middlemen, and they would have sublet extensively um, and made their money that way. But as the 19th century progressed, landlords realized that long leases didn't allow them to maximize the profit of increasing land prices. So they stopped offering long leases and began to offer short leases. So by the early 19th century then, most leases would have been on a yearly basis. Uh, and they, these were called yearly tenancies. You could argue that a yearly tenancy uh, isn't very secure. Nevertheless, there was a legal process which wrapped around this yearly process so that landlords had to give six months notice um, and, uh, um, to, for, to eject uh, a tenant. A tenant had the right to protest um, at this. So these tenant farmers were not tenants at will, with no rights whatsoever. Nevertheless, once they, if they were evicted, they had no right to any compensation for any improvements that they had made to the, tent, to the farm while they had been in it. It was only really by mutual consent and litigation, though, that the, um, that the agreement could be, um, could be broken. Nevertheless, there was little protection or little incentive so some historians feel, to improving their land. Now, what we do know as well is, is that there was another form of tenancy um, in Ireland that wasn't so common, um, uh, but has, I suppose, captured people's attention because it's really a form of early cooperative farming. And this is the leasehold system called Rundale. And if you're, in, if you're from Antrim at all, it's a very common feature um, along the North Antrim coast. So I'm going to talk about it um, uh, just here now. So in, this, in essence, Rundale or, um, is where a cluster of, of houses, people live together in a cluster of houses, and they own the land around those houses together in common. Okay, it's probably easiest if I just show you what um, a Rundale system looks like. And this is the Clacken of Crook, which is in the uh, townland of Mullisandle, which is in North Kilwater. And it's one of about six Clackens, which are in um, the Glenarm area. And you can see that there is a, there are, there's a cluster of houses where a number of farmers and their families live together. But you can see that the colors are each individual's holdings. So their farms are not discrete. 
they're separated all around the um, all around the total area, and this is due to the different quality of the land. So farmers who um, would each get a high quality, um, a similar quality chunks of land all together, and um, uh, and uh, you would have an infield where. Um, a, grazing, or sorry, where tillage would take place, potatoes, flax, um, and then the outfield where cows would have been grazed in common. So, let me just go back. Now the Rundale system was, generally speaking, not approved of by landlords. They felt it was inefficient, they felt it contributed to squabbling between family members, and so they sought to eliminate it, particularly improving landlords. Um, throughout the 19th century. Nevertheless, clackens like crocs survive into the 20th, it survived into the early 20th century in a number of areas. And the clacken project that the Glens of Antrim Historical Society has been running, for example, has identified 45 or 50 clackens just in the Glens area alone. Now, let's talk about the laborers, that bottom part of our triangle. Because in the 1861 census estimates that there were roughly speaking around 900,000, at least of, of um, these members of society in the, in the 1860s. Now it's hard to distinguish clearly who's a laborer and who's not because of the way people define themselves. Um, in the sense that quite often laborers when asked would define themselves as farmers because they would have had a small plot on which they could grow potatoes even if they were working for somebody else. But in general, a laborer or a member of the laboring classes is someone who doesn't have access to or isn't, um, doesn't have a lease agreement with a landlord. They are someone who's working for someone else in a couple of different ways. So when we use the term laborer, we're really referring to those individuals who worked for cash, okay, who would sell their labor to a farmer, say, by the day or for a particular period of time, or for a particular job, say building a road. They would then use this income to rent a house, um, sometimes a house and a small garden, on which they would grow potatoes. Now these plots were rented in Conacre. Conacre is a way of renting ground. Oh, it's also complicated, isn't it? Conacre is a way of renting ground for only 11 months for one harvest of potatoes. Okay? And it just means that you don't get any rights to claim it in perpetuity as yours. Okay? So, um, uh, so farmers could charge really high rents for these little conacre plots. Why wouldn't you? If you're a small farmer and you had a corner that you didn't really need, you could hive it off and give it to a laborer. Charge extortionate rent. And um, he would be stuck, really. And he, you would, he would hope that he would make enough cash over the year to pay his rent and that he would grow his potatoes to eat so he didn't have to buy food, and that he could keep a pig on that little tiny plot that he could kill at Christmas. Okay? So for a laborer, living on Conacre was really close to the subsistence line for many. And again, movers and shakers within the agricultural community in Ireland were conscious of the fact that some farmers, middlemen, could make substantial profits simply by hiving off substantial portions of their property in Conacre. And the reason I emphasize that is that we'll come back to that later on. Now there's another way in which laborers could have a waged relation or a relationship with a farmer, and that was by being a farm servant. Now farm servants were live-in servants on a farm. Okay, they weren't paid in cash. They would have been paid in kind or in room and board in essence. You would live with the farmer and his family maybe in a separate dwelling, maybe in the farmhouse itself. But you would live for, for a particular length of time. Um, and sometimes, if you were a farm servant, you would still have your own plot that you could farm. And if you were a farm servant and you had a little plot, this meant that you, that you again, took part in that conacre system, that 11-month system. But for farm servants, no cash is exchanging hands. Now we all know about the impact of the famine and how it was the laboring classes really who were the hardest hit by that terrible, uh, tra that terrible tragedy. 
And in the years after the famine, it's the poor, the laboring poor, whose numbers decline most sharply and who, um, who feature less and less in, the, uh, rural, in rural society. Between 1841 and 1891, for example, um, their numbers shrink substantially. But we shouldn't think that the laboring classes disappear from the countryside altogether, because farmers have always needed hired help at certain times of the year. They've always needed help if they are unmarried, um, they've always needed help if their family has left or their children are still too young to help in the fields. So there's always room for um, a waged laborer uh, in the rural economy. Now the problem is, is, is that you would think that wages would rise dramatically if there are fewer of you competing for similar sorts of jobs. But in fact, although this happens a little bit, it doesn't happen enough or a lot. So laboring wages rise in the post-famine uh, era, but not really enough. And that's because farmers aren't needing as much labor as they did in the pre-famine period. Why not? Well, for a couple of reasons, really. One is that more and more Irish farmers are, doing, are moving into farming that involves less labor. They're moving away from tillage, the growing of crops, and they're moving towards livestock grazing cattle in particular, and later on, eventually, sheep. So, throughout the late 19th century, then, you still see laborers, laborers from Ireland traveling to Scotland, for example, to be involved in tatty hoking. You still see laborers traveling to assist with the harvest in places in the south, for example, the spalpeen, for, um, as, as they were known. And you still see the continuance of the hiring fair, um, these twice yearly uh, fairs where laborers and farmers would come together to exchange contracts um, uh, of labor. I mean, there were still over 80 hiring fairs in operation across Ulster in the early 20th century. But as Bill Vaughan, a historian of land and labor and, uh, in, in Ireland, points out, no one in the 19th century really cared about the laboring classes. There was no movement to try and protect their rights or to improve their housing. No one rose up in protest um, at their working terms and conditions. Um, and much of this was because of the nature of who the laborers were. They were a transient group, quite often having to move far away from their family connections to get work. Quite often this was something that young people did before they got married and settled down. And so this is a group that's easily exploited, isn't it? Um, we also need to remember as well that for this group of individuals, they didn't have the vote until 1885. And so they've got no influence over the political system uh, in any way. And finally, we also need to think about them very much like we would think about domestic servants, that they were isolated from other people, quite often working maybe in ones or twos on isolated farms, it would be hard for them to get together, to organize themselves, to campaign for better, um, better working conditions. So in the 19th century, all of the protest movements about trying to change the agricultural system, they're not about trying to improve conditions for laborers. It's about trying to secure conditions for tenant farmers, that middling group. Okay. And alas, when, the, when society becomes more sympathetic, to the laboring class in the 1880s and the 1890s. This is when the laborer is disappearing, continues to disappear from the countryside. And so rural district councils in the 1890s begin to move to provide you know, government housing, um, council housing. But by this time, the, their numbers have greatly, greatly declined. So, um, I want to talk now about um, Ah, okay. So I want to talk a bit now about the rural economy in Ulster in the 19th century, now that we've got an idea of the different groups. And um, I'm going to do this really fast. <laughs> okay? So it's going to have hardly any detail in it at all, and um, which means that it might not sound true or believable. And uh, it's going to be quite bullet pointy. 
But the whole point is really just to give you a sense of the ebb and flow of historical events over the course of the 19th century. So, Ulster, if we look at it in ancient times, was a pastoral economy. And, tell your neighbor, what does, what's pasture? Again, what kind of farming is pasture farming? Livestock, that's right. It's grazing of, it's grazing of cows. No, but what happens is, is that in the 18th century, there's a shift towards tillage farming, which is crops and stuff. That's right. And the most popular crops that were grown in Ulster in the 18th century were oats, potatoes, and then in certain pockets of the, the country, um, flax, hay, and barley. Some of these were exported. Some were just for domestic consumption. But the, with the growth of population, there was more of a market for um, tillage, uh, tillage products. And with tillage comes the concept of enclosure, the building of, of stone walls and hedges to divide your property from the guy next door, these field boundaries. And so much of the landscape that we see today as we drive around the countryside is really a construction of the 18th century and is not a reflection of ancient Ireland at all. But unlike in the south of Ireland, where there was almost a total reliance on the potato crop, in Ulster, you had a mix. You had a much greater mix. Not only did you have a mix of livestock and tillage farming, you also had a mix between agricultural um, production and manufacturing. But hold on, with manufacturing, what we're talking about is, of course, is the manufacturing by hand of textiles, for the most part, linen cloth. Okay, this is weaving. Okay, but historians and commentators in the 18th and the early 19th century referred to this as manufacturing, because it was something that you had to do with a machine. Now, in the early 19th century, manufacturing was really very common in Ulster. And lots of people started to specialize and to focus on manufacturing flax or manufacturing linen in their own homes rather than concentrating on farming so much. This allowed them to make their farms smaller because they didn't need so much land in order to make it a going concern. They could use the money that they were earning from the sale of their textiles instead. Does that make sense? Okay. But what happens is, is of course the onset of the Industrial Revolution. And in short, it undercuts and destroys, really, although it takes about 40 years, the whole uh, domestic manufacturing process. So it's no longer economic to make linen in your own home. Hand loom weaving and the spinning of yarn is no longer economically viable. And so eventually people stop doing it. And so what ironically happens in Ulster in the early part of the 19th century is the deindustrialization of the countryside. Farms that had been mixed, making linen as well as growing crops and keeping animals, became far more exclusively agricultural in their focus. Um, and of course then there's the famine, which has its dreadful impact, even in Ulster, but what happens in the years after the famine, then, is, are, are the years of agricultural prosperity. So between about 1850 to about the 1870s, there's a steady growth and rise in agricultural prices, an improvement in wages, better conditions for farmers, um, uh, and so on. And in Ulster, then, agriculture begins to take on a number of key characteristics. So, we see a slow move towards um, pasture, okay? So Ulster society begins to move back towards cattle farming and eventually to sheep. So there's a dramatic increase then in the numbers of livestock on the, uh, in the north than there had ever been uh, before. This really takes off in the years after the 1870s. But what's distinct, interesting as well is, is that again, unlike the south, small farms remain the norm in Ulster in the years after the famine. Okay? In 1911, over three quarters of Ulster's farms were less than 30 acres. Okay? So very small. Um, and, uh, and this doesn't really change. Thirdly, there are modest improvements in the use of implements, in farming methods, in new breeds, and in soil improvement. 
And finally, then, the growth of Belfast creates this sort of creates a demand for tillage products, for food. Okay? So the farms around Belfast then um, uh, need to provide and can provide the Belfast markets with food. So tillage, which you might have expected to have dropped away in response to the famine, doesn't. It does, a, it does some, but not as much. The other thing that emerges in Ulster in the years after the famine, although it had existed beforehand, is this notion of tenant right, or what's known as the Ulster custom. Now, does anybody know? You could speak to your neighbor and nod quietly if you know what tenant right is. <sighs> okay, excellent. Um, tenant right is really quite complicated, number one. Number two, it depends on who you talk to, what it really means. Number three, it depends on what part of the country you were in, whether or not it operated to its fullest extent or not. So I recommend <laughs> reading Bill Vaughn's book on t before saying for sure. But in general, historians would say that tenant right is the right of a tenant to essentially sell his farm to the incoming tenant. Okay? Now technically speaking, if you are renting a property, okay, if you're renting your house, you don't have the right to sell it on to the next person who's coming in, do you? Right? Because you're only paying rent. Well, in Ulster, what had emerged over time was the idea that tenants had an interest in their farm and that they could sell that interest on to the next guy, on to the incoming tenant. Now, some people said that this was because this the, the way the reason that this emerged was that this was a payment for the improvements that farmers had put into their farms. But that wasn't always the case. Lots of farms got sold and for high tenant right prices, but they were really quite dilapidated. So after a while, it, some people argued that it was really more of a cultural thing, that it was um, this that it was a. Um, I suppose, an idea, a sense of identity that Ulster farmers had, um, a sense of pride almost, that it had become a traditional right that they were entitled to um, uh, if, if they sold. But what's interesting is, is that this portmanteau concept of being allowed to sell tenant right, sorry, I should have said as well that tenant right prices could be extortionate. They could be upwards of 20 or 30 years the cost of your annual rent. So, so if your annual rent is 10 shillings, it might be 10, 20, 30, 40 times that amount that you would get from uh, when you sold or when you moved on. So this was extremely, extremely high. Um, and it required large bank loans to be able to finance. Uh, and the problem really was then, was is that this portmanteau word, I should say, to return to what I was saying, is, is that this became the focal point for many tenant farmer grievances. And it became the cry of tenant, of farming reformers in the 19th century, who claimed that it encapsulated what they called the three Fs, fair rent, free sale, and fixity of tenure. Okay, so security of tenure, the right to sell your interest, and a fair rent. Okay, so Ulster custom is seen to be part and parcel of the growing nationalist movement in the south of Ireland for changes to the land system altogether. And in the 1870s, when there are a series of bad harvests, and there's desperately, desperately wet weather, much like we've had over the, here over the last two or three summers. Um, the calls for tenant right to become legalized extend across the country. And this becomes the foundation for the land agitation movement of the 1870s and the 1880s, which ultimately leads to the dramatic transformation of the landed system in Ireland altogether. So you have a political leadership in place, okay, Fenians, if you will, or the Irish Republican Brotherhood, um, the Irish nationalist uh, politicians led by Charles Stuart Parnell, and the Land League, 
a number of different groups all banding together around this notion of the three F's. And the government responds because the society is massively disaffected. So the Land Act is passed in 1870, it's expanded in 1881, and there are then a succession of acts after <coughs> that that culminate in 1909, which ultimately bring about owner occupancy. Okay? Landlords are obliged or forced by law to sell their estates. And, uh, and in essence, tenant farmers no longer lease, but they own their own farm. And now we're up to about 1921. And I'm not doing too badly. So, And just to give you an idea then of the transformation that's taken place, by 1921, Alwyn Purdue indicates that there were 83,700 new owners of their farms across Ulster. And over 1.9 million acres had changed hands in the previous sort of 10, 20 years. A lot of people have referred to this as a revolution um, in land ownership. Um, Purdue doesn't go quite that far because she points out that a number of landlords still manage to hold on to small portions of their estate and still continue to be influential uh, players within Ulster society. But there's a couple of, so that kind of brings me to the end of the survey there, giving you an idea of hopefully the way in which Ulster's rural economy has, um, has evolved and changed. Now, there's some areas that I haven't even touched on. And I'm going to just flick through my slides very quickly here to illustrate those. Because you're probably wondering, well, so what, really? But how does, what about my family? How would that have affected them? Well, the one thing that we would have known about for sure, I should say, is the idea of housing. Okay, so everybody's ancestors who were here on the island would have had a house. And you can see that um, this graph shows um, the results from the 1841 census, which indicate the number of people who lived in Class 4 housing. So the census enumerators in 1841 divided the types of houses into four types, you, um, generally speaking on the basis of rooms. So Class 4 houses were one room, generally sometimes a stone, but they could also be made of mud, with or without a window. And you can see that um, uh, the percentage of class four houses extends right across Ulster, but it's particularly prevalent in the West. And once again, this is pretty common um, uh, throughout the 19th century that the West is poorer um, than, than the East when it comes to housing. And you can see as well, if you look at the distribution of building materials, right? So the little black dots, they're like stone and earth or just earthen walls, and the little white dots uh, are stone walls. So you can see, interestingly, how Antrim stands out for the almost exclusive stone wall construction of its houses, and how the mud wall construction is really a feature of the West and Donegal, and then sort of stretching down there through South Tyrone and Armagh. To give you an idea as well about um, uh, Ulster house building, um, you can see that there were sort of two types of houses that Ulster farmers would have lived in for the most part. And this house type is called the direct entry, in that you walk straight into the kitchen and the hearth is always then on a diagonal to the front door. The appearance of the house from the outside would have looked a little bit like this. And again, I'm sure this is a very common um, uh, house feature for all of us, with the two little windows out to the front. So if on the census you've got your family is indicating that they've only got two windows, it's more than likely that their house looks something along these lines. This was most common in the north and the west of Ulster. This arrangement, which is called the jam wall or... Um, Oh, what's the other word for it? Um, is or is a um, is more typical of um, as it says here, South Fermanagh and Cavan, 
bits of West Down, Armagh, East Tyrone, and etc. And what you have is, and you can see it better here, okay, is, is that you're standing inside the house. You can see the open front door to your left, okay, and there's a little wall there just in front of you. And behind it is the hearth, okay? Now, quite often, Ulster fa farmers or families would have put a small window in here. So you could be sitting at the hearth, and if someone came to the door, you could see who it was. And again, examples of both of these can be seen up at the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum. So, um, I wanted to talk about two other things before I go, or just mention, in flying past. That if you want to, and you're thinking about coming back, um, we could talk a bit more detail, either next week or in a future lecture, is the issue, is the, is the, um, uh, the issue of demography. Okay? Now, demography is the study of population change. Okay? So it's um, uh, how populations in a particular area change over time. And they change over time by three different ways, really. One is emigration or inward migration. They change because of marital habits. People get married young, therefore have lots of babies because there's no birth control. Okay? Or they, um, uh, or population can also change through fertility, okay? And fertility can be high in that women have lots of children, or fertility can be low in that women don't have lots of children because they either control their fertility in some way or they marry late, okay? Now, there's lots of information about how that affects Ulster families, and we can talk about that, but we don't have time today because I'd really like to show you a bit more about how you could chase your family up by, look, by um, uh, in, the, um, in some of the sources. Um, and I want, to sh I want to talk about the Oakleys, really. <laughs> okay, so we can do that. I might just do that anyway. Um, next week. So, let's talk about the Oakleys, right? Okay, pretend that they're your family, possibly. Okay, um, so the Oglebees are, are my family, um, and I'm very boldly giving you my family tree in your little handouts. So if you wanted to look, you can see um, where I fit um, in my, uh, I don't even know, because I haven't even included it as a slide here. <laughs> so if you wanted to have a look, you can see um, that um, this delightful lady here on the far right hand side is my great grandmother. It's my mother's maternal grandmother. And behind her is her husband. This is Susan Ogilvy. And her husband behind her there is Samuel Martin. Samuel Martin has his hand also on his mother's shoulder, Ellen Martin. And the gentleman on the left is his brother, Hugh Martin. These three girls are my grandmother's older sisters. She was born after they emigrated to Canada um, around about 1906, 1907. So she's not actually there. Okay? Now, what I know about them is, is that they were laborers, agricultural laborers through and through, the Oglebees. The um, Oglebees are the ones who are from Kilwater Parish, outside Larne. And um, you can see this is Kilwater here. I'll come back to some of those other sites in a second. Okay. But what's interesting is that for some reason, Susan Ogilby, who seems never to have left Kilwater until she emigrated, um, marries Hugh Martin, who's actually from County Down. He's from Dremore in County Down. But it would seem that Ellen had been widowed fairly early. Her husband died in 1888, and she doesn't die until 1915. And it would seem that her and her elder sons moved to Kilwater because there is a cotton spinning factory there. Um, probably by this point, a, um, a, a weaving factory. So if we look, we can find them. I can find them in the census, in the census online. There's Samuel Martin who's the head of family, he's a Presbyterian, he can read and write, he's about 25, and he's listed as a cotton beamer from County Down. Susan Martin is, unsurprisingly, um, a, a housekeeper, and there 
you can see um, there is Ellen Martin, so that's Samuel's mother. There's Mary Martin, uh, sorry, Ellen Martin, her daughter, and Mary, her other daughter, and then Alexander Ogilby, her brother-in-law, who's also a cotton weaver and not married. So her single brother, younger brother, is living with them in 1901. By 1911, this family is no longer there, so we know that they've emigrated. At the time of the 1901 census, though, um, you can see that they were living here in what's called Millbrook, just outside um, uh, Larne. Now, Millbrook was a small weaving village that emerged around a weaving factory that had been there since, well, a factory had been there since the middle of the 18th century. It was a bleach green initially, um, and over time, spun and wove cotton, and then it moved into uh, flax and linen. Um, so I should also point out as well that you can see from the census what kind of a house they were living in too. Okay, and everybody's pretty familiar with reading a census and knows how to use form B1. So I don't need to go into that, right? Because you're adding up your numbers, which gives you your second class house, right? So we know that they all, they're only living in a house which has two windows um, to the front. I'm assuming that it's row housing, like you would see again up at uh, Cultura. Okay, but it's a private dwelling and um, second class house, right? So nothing fancy. So what was life like for them? Where did they come from? Had they always lived in Millbrook? Um, and what was their relationship then to farming that took place within the community? Um, so the first thing I thought I would do then is to find out a bit more about Killwater itself. Again, anybody can go online and find Lewis's Topographical Dictionary or any one of the other many dictionaries from your local library that will tell you a bit about what the nature of your parish or your townland is. So Lewis's Topographical Dictionary then, which is dated 1837, says that Kiltwater is about 9,800 acres. About a third of it is arable. So it's by no means a wealthy or, uh, or particularly strong farming area. The rest of it is described as being mountainous and boggy. And while here looks like a fairly typical kind of Irish country lane, you can see here that um, the upper part of the parish heading towards Glenarm is far more bleak and desolate, but yet strangely beautiful, I think. What was interesting is about Kilwater was the strong presence of lime, uh, limestone and basalt. Um, uh, now another source from the 1830s, the Ordnance Survey Memoirs, again, a fantastic source, says pretty much the same thing. Um, they point out that Kilwater was totally rural. There wasn't a town or a village in the place. That it was mainly farming, but that there was also a bit of limestone quarrying and some what they called rural manufacturing. And they point to the bleach green, which had been there, and they also point to the cotton factory, which, in 1837, they say is now idle. Why? You know the answer. I've told you. Why is the cotton factory in the 1830s idle? Why is it not working anymore? I don't know, cities. Well, it's like the collapse of the whole cotton industry, right? We talked about the collapse of domestic cotton and the collapse of the whole sort of textile sector. So the factory staggers on throughout the 19th century, but the cotton production is no longer viable. So the um, almost nine tenths of Kilwater were owned, was owned by um, the Agnew family. The Agnews of Kilwater Castle. Now the Agnews were an ancient family. They seem to have come to Ulster from Scotland in the 17th century during the plantation. Um, but they were dogged repeatedly by inheritance problems. And they were not well served either by the good survival of records to find out a little bit more about them. The old squire seems to have been the, sort of the scion of the family from the 18th century, William Agnew. And it was his grandson, Edward Jones, who, uh, when he inherited, took the name Agnew, who carried on the estate and was responsible for it from the, 18, from the 1770s 
until about the 1820s. He then passed his estate on to his niece, Margaret Jones, who was unmarried, and who died seemingly in the mid-1840s. She was succeeded by her nephew, another William Agnew, who inherited the estate in his 20s. He seems to have moved abroad and, um, and to uh, be living in France by the 1880s. And certainly, this is where my story gets a little hazy, because I think there's an illegitimate child somewhere along the line who marries an Italian count called Balzani, who inherits the estate and takes over the estate by the early 20th century. And this is what happens to cool water, you see. So if you ever go out there, it's an absolute ruin and a wreck because it was seized by the government during World War II under the um, Alien Property Act, okay? So um, uh, foreign nationals weren't allowed to own property. So the, so the family um, wasn't doing great. And in the middle then, there were these other relatives, the Galt Smiths, who, um, who occupied um, Kilwater for a while. And they had American connections and seemed to have been quite popular. Now, um, you can see here that a few, Prony has some of the Agnew Estate papers. Now this is a, um, these are just photocopies of a book of maps containing the several estates belonging to Edward Jones Agnew. So it's not just Kilwater, there's a couple of other North Antrim parishes in there as well, if anyone's doing Antrim history. And again, it's very poor, it's hard to tell. But this kind of gives you an idea, you can see these little dots here are meant to be trees around the Killwater Domain. But let me keep pressing on, okay? Because um, I wanted you to have a look at the, again in your handout, the, um, the extracts that I gave you from the Ordnance Survey memoirs. And what's interesting about them, really, is that they illustrate in Killwater many of the concepts that I talked about in my previous talk. Um, they illustrate small farm size, okay? They illustrate the kind of farming that's carried out, that it was mixed. They illustrate the condition of the houses, okay? That the houses were largely stone with slate roofs. And what I think is most interesting is if you have a look under, um, if you have a look at the little heading titled Proprietor, it says, Miss Jones is proprietor of the entire parish. She will not allow any under-tenants. All must pay rent to her. Neither will she allow any farmer to keep more than one laborer or cottier. Now you could see that as being really nasty, but you could also see it as her actively seeking to manage her estate so that the spread of Conacre and the, sp let's, the spread of cottiers and the, the hiving off of rental income to the tenant class doesn't happen. And what you get really throughout is, is that Miss Jones is a very active, um, she's a very, she, sorry? No, 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 no. That's for Salvos, no? No. Um, is it? is that Miss Jones is a very active landlord and, um, uh, uh, and is involved in all sorts of, sorts of things. Now if you're going to trace your family within um, looking around the whole issue of land, I'm going to wrap up in five minutes, okay? Um, what you really need to know about, well, apart from the census, is valuation records. And I don't know about you, but valuation records really scare me but not anymore. <laughs> um, because valuation is really just a big scary word for taxes, right? So the government needs to know how much tax you pay. So how do you, how do you pay your taxes now? You pay them in the form of rates, don't you? And if you live in Belfast, you pay your annual rate bill. Well, how, is your, how are your rates assessed? Like, how do you know that, how do you, do you know, how does Belfast City Council know how much to charge you for your rates? The size of your property, the value of it, where it's located. And so they've got professional guys who like know these things and go around, who we trust aren't gouging us and overcharging us. Okay? It's exactly the same way in the 19th century. 
The whole concept of valuation is exactly the same, except they didn't have any good maps and they were making the system from scratch. Okay? So they needed to get the guys, the engineers, to go out and map the whole country. That's where the Ordnance Survey maps all come from. So then they could send out the bean counters, right, to look at this land and say, okay, on the open market, how much do we think that would get? And there's your valuation, okay? And that's really pretty much where the valuation comes from. Now we all know as well that, the, um, that there was a small valuation in the 1830s taken, and then there was a major valuation in the 1860s, which has been printed and published called Griffiths Valuation. And you can find it and access it online through the Ask About Ireland website. Okay? Now, what I always find terrifying is, is, is that how am I going to find, is when I find my family, which is really easy, you know, I mean, I put Ogilvy in the search box, and I typed Antrim, and I got 10 hits. Okay, if you're Smith, I'm really sorry. You know, you are going to have to work a bit harder, right? Um, but it was part of the reason why I chose the Ogilvy's, right? Because they're not all that common. And so this is, this is one of the hits. Um, and here is the return for Sheriff's Land. Now the one thing that I've never ever understood is, is, is about, is, is that what do all those columns mean? Ugh, it's all really confusing. I just don't get what the columns are about. So what I've tried to do here is to give you a little bit of a key to the columns. So let's work our way across the document first. Okay, and then um, uh, we'll talk about the first column a bit more, in a bit more detail. So in this first column here, these are the references to the valuation to the maps. If you want to find out where that little chunk of property is, this is the, you need to know what this number is. Okay, we'll come back to that in a second. This is the name of the person who is the tenant, who's leasing the property, the lessee. This column here is the lessor. This is the person who owns the property, okay? This column is the description. This describes what they're actually getting. Now, most of the time you can see up here, it'll say house, maybe house and small garden, maybe house and offices. Now, you would think really in rural Kilwater, there are unlikely to be large office blocks floating around. And of course, you'd be absolutely right, because offices is the 19th century expression for farm buildings or outbuildings, like a buyer or a pig house. Okay? Now, the columns across here are the valuation, the amount of money that it would have cost. Okay? The first column is the size of the property in acres, roods, and perches. If anybody wants to know all about all of that, you can ask me after. Except to say that an acre is 160 perches square. A perch in Irish plantation acres is seven yards long. And there are four roods to an acre and 40, oh, I'm getting all mixed up now. But anyway, you get the idea. An acre is 160 perches square. That's my understanding. Okay, and the next two columns then divide the valuation up into land and buildings. They separate it out, okay? And then the final is your total. Okay? Now, let's go back very quickly to the um, first column. Because the first column are the references to the Ordnance Survey maps if you want to find where your plot is. So if you have a number, single number, next to the name of the entry, it means that that individual holds the entire piece of land. If, however, next to the number there is a capital letter, A or B, these are two separate plots, not next door to each other, but within the same uh, townland, okay, that are let by the same individual. Okay? If you have small letters, these are houses that are leased separately from the plot that's all around them. Okay? So it's a house on a plot, but rented by a different person than the lessor of the surrounding ground. 
All right. Now what's nice about Griffiths is that it's all nice and tidy and printed up. But it's only for the 1860s. If you want to find out what happens afterwards, you can come into, well, you can go online and you can look at the revision books. Okay? And these are what they look like. But I've pulled these off the internet. Okay? And so you can see here is the revision book for uh, the 1860s. Now, I should maybe come back to the Ogilvy's very briefly, just to say that I was a bit disappointed not to find Samuel in the Griffiths. But when I looked at the revision book, what do I find? Down here, there's John Ogilvy, and there's scratched out above is Samuel. I think that's my guy. Okay? And you can see that he's renting from William Agnew, unsurprisingly, a house and a garden, 30 perches, okay? So not even half an acre. I think, if my math's right, worth 15 shillings in total, okay? And he came into possession with this little number at the end. It says 1865. How do I know? Because the inks match. And if you want to um, hear a fantastic, or read a fantastic analysis of valuation records, you can go online to Bill McAfee's website. And he talks quite a lot about um, how the vagaries of fading ink um, and its implications for family history. So in subsequent years then, you can see how properties change hands. And eventually what happens is, is that the Ogilvy's um, lose the land. And um, they eventually end up in Millbrook. Okay, and you can see them here um, in uh, uh, taking over from a John McCann. Um, when it's Millbrook, and the, the lessor is Millbrook Weaving Company, okay? But John Waters takes over in 1906 or thereabouts. So I know that the, that the Martins must have had to have emigrated um, uh, around about that time. Now, what's really interesting is, is that here's where they are on the map. I'm, it makes no relationship to anything. I'm sorry, it could be anywhere on the island, right? It just doesn't even look like... I, had, I even cut off kill water in order to do this. But what I wanted to explain, just again, just in closing, is, is that quite often, I think, if you're looking through valuation records, you wonder why does your family have a small chunk of land in another town land, which is really small and doesn't seem to match up to anything, right? So when I was doing my research for, for my Samuel Ogilby and his daughter Susan, I came across this other family called David Ogilby. Now, David Ogilvy occupies plot two in Boydstown, which is this little L shape here, okay? But he also occupies this other little chunk, which is number 10, in the next door townland. But if you can see, and I'm, again, I apologize, that's 10 right there. So you can see what he's doing makes complete sense when you look at the map. All he's doing is he's squaring off his farm and taking advantage of um, the, the fact that there's a small dip um, to rent the land on the other side of the townland border. So do look at the maps if you can um, and try and match, up the, uh, and match up the numbers. Okay, so I've kept everybody for a very long time. There's just a few more maps here as well. There's lots of other sources to find your family. Um, I'm not going to talk about any of these, obviously, um, but um, uh, there are, there's also this whole notion of serendipity. If you're ever thinking or have a few minutes, use Prony's e-catalog and just type your family member's <coughs> name into the catalog because you won't have any idea of what you'll find. I found this document on Monday about poor old David Ogilvy with his farm in Boydstown, which he has to borrow money from his neighbor, and if he doesn't pay it back in six months, he forfeits his whole farm. And what does he say? He says he will make over to the said Andrew Jingles all his estate, his tenant right, interesting, okay, term and interest in and to that farm of land and premises situate in Boydstown, okay, which he holds as tenant from year to year. Okay? You know all of these things, right? Those all make sense now because, hopefully, my wonderful little talk earlier. All right? 
is, is that you now know that this is normal to have a yearly tenancy. We also know, of course, he's in Ulster. He would have tenant right, wouldn't he? Okay, so in this sense, just to wrap it all up nicely, is my family utterly typical <laughs> of a fa farming family from North Antrim? And not particularly unusual, except in that they end up becoming industrial laborers in an area which was not particularly industrial, and they eventually end up emigrating, which maybe not everybody does. Now, if you're interested, come back next week and we'll talk about schools and education in the north of Ireland and what happens to the Ogilvies and if we can find them in any educational records. Okay? Thank you for your time. I'm sorry I went over. If anyone has any questions,